Good day. This is Dr. Battle, and now we're uh, going to look at uh, different literary genres that are found in the book of Pen in the in the Pentateuch. And as you know, literary genres are different types of literature. Now we're not going to be exhaustive here, but just kind of introduce you to the different types of uh, literature that are found within the that we have. We could we will call them the is that is mostly narrative. Most of the Pentateuch is actually narrative. Now we know we call it the law and we will touch upon legal literature a little later on but most of it is narrative and we can talk about narratives in uh, different forms. In fact uh, there are these meta narratives and these are the grand stories uh, of the people of Israel that set the tone and character of them. Part of the meta narrative for America is the city on the hill and that America is destined to bring liberty throughout the world. And that's part of the meta-narrative of the United States. But uh, you have basically three different types of meta-narratives in the Pentateuch. First, you have cosmological meta-narratives. Now, the cosmological nar meta-narratives are Genesis 1 and specifically Genesis 6 through 9. And these are events that affect the whole world. The cosmos is affected. For Genesis 1, you have the creation of the world. In the flood narrative, you have the whole world being destroyed. And in this section, you, you get a sense of, uh, of the foundational beliefs of of the ancient Israelites. Now some scholars like to call this myth and they, what they're talking about here is they're trying to say that these are the stories that set the values for culture and uh, set the different uh, what, what the, how a culture will look at the world. In other words they set the world view uh, in our culture today. Now it's not they'll tell you when they present this to you that this is not necessarily referring to whether the stories are true or not. It's just that these set the tone and the basic beliefs of that culture. Now in our culture, the meta narrative, uh, cosmological narrative that we have is evolution. Now other scholars take a less um, a different type of approach to it and we'll call it the primordial history. In other words, the history of things before we uh, began having a concrete, uh, hist a concrete written record. And it sets the stage for what's to come. In this one you see uh, uh, man's relationship to God, that the world was created good, but then the mankind rebelled against God. And you see the conflict between God and man established here. And also the conflict between God, mankind and nature and also mankind versus mankind being set here. Then beginning in Genesis uh, 11 we start having what are called the ancestral narratives. Now this is basically the story of Abraham and his family and we'll continue on through Genesis and this is a very dominant one and you see uh, you know Abraham and his story and then comes Jacob and his story and or Isaac and his story and then Jacob and then it goes all the way to Joseph and the people of moving to Egypt but it's the called also called the patriarchal narratives. In other words these narratives set the story of the identity of the people of Israel as being descendants of Abraham. Uh, in this case, we could probably look at the uh, uh, pilgrims coming to America as looking for religious freedom as part of a patriarchal narrative of America. Then last we come are the national narratives. And this is, well, you can think of what's a national narrative that has to do with the nation. Well, when was the nation of Israel born? Well, that has to do with, begins with the Exodus events. So there in Exodus, uh, we begin with the story of Moses and Exodus. And we see how the tribes of Israel go from being uh, just a people group within the nation of Egypt and become their own tribal nation there in Sinai and then eventually become their own nation there in the land of Canaan. And so here we have the national histories. We could think of uh, the founding fathers, George Washington, that sort of thing, if you want to make a, uh, a link. Now, that's the big stories. Underneath that, we have some more specialized types of narratives. Uh, the first type is the etiology narratives, and these are the ones that uh, tell the story, and then they'll explain why something's called uh, given a name. The classic one that will be pointed out is typically there in Genesis chapter uh, 10, where you have the story of the Tower of Babel, 9 and 10, where you have the story of the Tower of Babel, and at the end in, in um, 
uh, I think around verse 9, it comes uh, around to telling you that uh, about the destru destruction of the Tower of Babel, and, and that is where the languages were confused, and thus it was called Babel. In fact, we still have that etymolo etymology in our own language where we talk about people just babbling, just talking and not making any sense, and that becomes a reflection on the nation of Babel, that is a, th that is a confusion of languages. And on top of that, you'll have genealogies. Now, genealogies will serve different functions. In the early part of Genesis, you have the genealogies of Cain, which help trace, which focuses on the uh, progression of, of technology and the progression of the human race seeking its ways, and also a hint of the arrogance, arrogance of the human race through the story of Lamech and how he brags to his wives that he of what he has done. Now, other genealogies have links in time, and there's controversies on these because of the, the lifespan that they grant, but they give a, an account of a specific family through time and just kind of connect uh, each generation with the next so that the original readers, the Israelites, could see how they related to Adam and see how they related to Noah and see how they related to uh, Abraham and see how they related to Moses and uh, go on down uh, the line and see where they were. And then you have itineraries. Now itineraries are basically travel itineraries. The most easy to identify is the one of the travel narrative of the Jews leaving uh, Egypt and traveling through Sinai. You also have several dealing with Abraham and his travels throughout the Promised Land. Now in addition to that, throughout the um, uh, Pentateuch there are also sc spattered through uh, poetic elements. And I just see a problem in my thing, but I'm not going to correct it. Um, poetic elements. Now, the Bible has a lot more, po has much, has many more poetic elements than we have time to look at right now in this introductory course. But if you look through your Bibles, and if, like, for example, if you open up to Genesis chapter 127, you'll see that in most translations nowadays, they suddenly change the format of the text. And what they're doing there is letting you know that that section, or at least the translators consider it, um, consider it to be um, uh, poetic. And well, when you look at these poetic sections, you'll often find that they are important to the narrative of the story. In fact, the very first poetic uh, section we see is the statement that man is created in God's image and typically it's in its type of parallelism which we'll talk about later when we're in the Psalms but so God created man in his own image in the thing in the image of God he created him male and female he created them and so here we see that the image of God is emphasized in the story by going from a narrative uh, block a prose format into a poetic format uh, we'll also see the same thing happen in Genesis uh, 4, I mean Genesis chapter 2 verse 4, where you have, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord made the earth and the heavens. Now when you look at the last two lines there, we have what's called a chiasm, uh, which you have the elements balancing it off. Notice the first line begins, heavens, earth, created, and the next, last line ends with God made, earth, heavens, and you can kind of walk, watch it go to the middle to creation, and then God made, and back out to the heavens, a uh, kind of a, a, a chiasm where you f find each element paralleling the next. Uh, the next place that we see poetic uh, passages is in the curse after the fall in Genesis 3, 14 through 19, and here you find that uh, the various, the, the punishment for mankind's sin is given out here and there's different things that are kind of interesting in that curse because within that curse is also a blessing and a hope uh, one thing that i uh, be we can look at and just on a side note um, in the curse against the serpent in verse 15 it says I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring uh, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel this is the first prophecy dealing with the um, hope that one day mankind will be freed from this sin, this, 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 
the evil that has come into the world, and it will come through the seed of the woman. Now, this is the point that most ancients would have said the Bible was inaccurate scientifically. Uh, they would have looked at that passage and they would have gone, what? Uh, everybody knows, uh, in fact, uh, the word offspring there, if you see the little number one in your text if, at, in Genesis 3:15, you'll see that it goes down, that's the Hebrew word seed. And uh, that's what's part of the text notes, letting you know the meaning. Now, look at that verse 15 and go down, and you'll see that seed. Well, in the ancient world, everybody who took biology 101 or the birds and the bees understood that the seed came from the male, not the female. And so when this says that be between the seed of the woman and the seed of the man, or the seed of the serpent, they're going like, the serpent's okay, but the woman doesn't have the seed. So this guy doesn't know his biology 101. This is the, what the ancients would have considered the first scientific error. But, on this interesting, that if you go all the way to Genesis, this ends up in being solved through the virgin birth. Because a seed of man was not used to for Christ's birth. It was the seed of the woman. So Christ, we see, turns out to be the seed of the woman who crushes the serpent's head. And um, and so we have the hope of the of the blessing. Also within the next verse we see is Genesis 4, 23 through 24. And here you have Lamech's boast. Now Lamech's boast suddenly breaks the pattern that we've had before. And he enters into uh, a poetic statement uh, there in Genesis chapter 4, verses uh, 23 through 24. And he refers, talks to his wife, not wives. Now notice he has two wives. This is the first time marriage has been reconfigured. And he's very arrogant. He says to his two wives, Adala and Zillah, hear my voice. You wives of Limech, listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-seven. Old. And so here we see an arrogance starting to develop in mankind. And again, the texts were focused into it by a sudden shift from prose to poetic narrative. And that's what a lot of the more recent translations are real good about doing for us. Okay, now we're going to come to a, the next legal, the next literary genre that we find in the Pentateuch, and one that it's known for. Uh, we often call the Pentateuch the Law or the Torah, and so of course we expect to find legal literature. Now, the first type of legal literature we'll look at will be the covenant form, which is really uh, found throughout the Old Testament. Then, now, the book of Deuteronomy fits a covenant form very tightly from very beginning to end. Some scholars will even argue that the whole Pentateuch fits the um, uh, treaty forms. And these were the types of, this is the format and the pattern that you found when um, uh, in the treaties between like Egypt and Hittite and between the Assyrians and the Sumerians, it was a basic type of format that they used in their uh, international agreements between nations or between the king and a, peep, a specific, specific element of the population. We'll look at just one uh, one one aspect of it because it's quite it gets quite involved and we don't really have time into it you just need to know that there are such things as these covenant forms or treaty forms and uh, we'll look at one that was uh, highlighted by a man named George E. Mendenhall um, and uh, he was look he noticed that in uh, Exodus chapter 19 you have the beginnings of a uh, treaty form and it first begins with the pro historical prologue there. And uh, in fact, it actually begins a little earlier than that. You could say, uh, let me just read it to you. On the, th on the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day came to the wilderness of Sinai. They set up from Raphidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain, while Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. 
Now notice that phrase, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians. That is a historical prologue. It gives a history of the relationship. And God's about to make some demands upon Israel. But uh, he's making those demands based upon a prior relationship. Then he goes on into verse 5 and tells what, the expe what he expects of Israel. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. Now here he extends a stipulation. If you follow my covenants, you will be my people and you will be my special possession, which could be considered a blessing. And then he goes on and expands upon that a little bit more and says, um, And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And these words that uh, you shall speak, and the, these are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. And so here we have the beginning of a covenant form where God establishes first his relationship, then he is, is put forth his stipulations, his requirements for that contract, and then he concludes with the blessings. Now, throughout the um, Pentateuch, we have different legal codes. And these are self-contained units that scholars have identified over the years as various rules or various self, uh, code books or law books that are found in the, in, in, the old, in the Pentateuch. The most famous, of course, is the Book of the Covenant, and it typically is associated with Exodus 20, 22 through 23, 19. And these, in a sense, expand upon the Ten Commandments. In other words, this is a part of the covenant that, uh, in fact, we've just kind of probably read part of the introduction of it, uh, whereby God stipulates how he expects the people of Israel to live and how they expect them to exercise justice. Another one is the ritual code, which is found in Exodus 34, 10 through 36. And here you have the Sabbath law and different religious practices that the Israelites are supposed to follow. Uh, then you have the Deuteronomic stick code. Now this one is by many modern scholars is associated with Josiah. Uh, but it's the core of the book of Deuteronomy. And here you have the, the expounding upon the, the Ten Commandments and the expounding upon the need for social and righteous social justice and different things of that sort uh, throughout this uh, for the people. But it kind of, this is a, the shift in this one is a little bit more focused on an urban culture, while the Book of the Covenant, similar to the Deuteron Deuteronomic Code, is more focused on a... Um, tribal culture a uh, that is not necessary that is country that doesn't have as many cities the last grouping is the holiness code and this has to do with how the Israelites are to separate themselves unto God and a lot of uh, sexual law laws dealing with uh, 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 fornication and different types of sins like that are described here in this section but these are the four main uh, uh, legal codes that seem to be that have been identified as by scholars as kind of self-standing in the book of the Pentateuch about uh, uh, the laws of the Old Testament we discover that these laws have two different forms and uh, this is comes to us from a man by the name of Albrecht Alt uh, in 1966 he proposed and uh, identified within the Old Testament two different types of laws. One form is the Apodidic Law, which is the Ten Commandments. You know, thou shalt not do this, or thou shalt, uh, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not uh, bear false witness, um, you shall not covet it. These are absolute laws. These are laws that give a um, absolute uh, determination that... Um, that uh, this is wrong. Now, typically in these laws, there's no penalty attached to it. It's, it's basically a moral declaration that this is wrong. Um, the used to be said that this was unique to the Old Testament Pentateuch, but now we have found a few like these in the other codes. But it still is that there are more apodidic laws found in the Pentateuch than any other of the ancient codes that we have to compare it with. The other type of law is causistic law. And causistic law 
uh, is different from uh, apodictic in that it's kind of a simple way of talking about it is it's case law. It's a simple way of, 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 uh, of identifying it. And basically it usually has an if-then statement in it. It says that if, you, if this and this happens, then uh, this is the liability of it. Uh, let's do we go to uh, Exodus 21. And we have one there right afterwards in Exodus 21. Um, go through, let's say 21, 12. It says, whenever, whoever strikes a man so that he dies, he, he, so that he dies shall be put to death. Now notice this. You know, it's basically studying the liability. If you hit a man and he dies, you're liable to the death penalty. Uh, now then it goes on and gives some conditional statements after that in verse 13. But if he did not lie in wait for him, but God let him fall into his hand, then I, appoint, I will appoint for you a place uh, to which he may flee. But if the man willfully attacked another man to kill him by cunning, you shall take him from my altar that he may die. In other words, if you killed somebody, uh, you were liable to the death penalty. Now, there was mercy if it was an accident. There was uh, certain laws that allowed you to escape the death penalty, but you still were liable for that life. Basically, what happened is you could go to one of the cities of refuge, and if it was determined that you had accidentally killed, you could stay in that city of refuge until the high priest died, and then you could return home. So your life was disrupted, just like that person's life was disrupted, but your life wasn't taken. On the other hand, if you were, if it was shown that you willfully killed the person, intentionally killed them, then your life was forfeit. But notice it's a causistic. Um, it's not saying don't hit in a sense. It's not saying that God approves of him. It's just saying that if you do this activity, this is the liability. And there's another law whereby if you dig a pit, it doesn't say don't dig a pit, but it says if you dig a pit and you don't make take necessary precautions and somebody falls in it and gets hurt, you're liable for that damage. And so these laws are oftentimes a way of looking at it. They're, they determine liability for our actions. Uh, the apodictic law we could simply view as moral law, while the causistic law we could view as liability. What are we liable for if certain things happen? Now you have to remember these laws were given in a different time, in a different period. They were given in a tribal context, and so uh, they won't necessarily fit within our world, but they would be... Uh, they are useful in understanding the writers of this law. And if you're a Christian, you understand that these laws ultimately came from God, and therefore it gives you an insight into the mind of God. Okay, take care, and have a good day. Bye.